Good afternoon. And it is a good afternoon. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, as the old saying goes here. Uh, we are back for round two. Sounds like a 1940s serial on the movie theaters. Come back to this, this theater for the next exciting chapter of our story. Uh, today, though, we're going to talk about the theorists. And as you see in that handout, I have five people. I could have put more. <laughs> but we would have been here till next week. Uh, but these theorists are, um, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they transcend the eras here, too, is how I have this arranged. Uh, the, it, it, it's, it's fascinating how this idea of maintaining a conservative outlook on this religion uh, held sway through the centuries with these theorists. And they are actually, they form that bulwark, if you will, or that foundation, uh, at least in part, for the jihadi movement as you see it today. And again, this goes back, we can go back to the 13th century for this. So that's a long time. That's a long time for something to ferment you want to use that term for it. However, what I want to do is I want to start with something, and I mentioned last week, if you recall, that I said that this religion, some people like to call it a religion, I guess it is, it's also a movement. It's also an effort, if you think about it, a seventh century effort in social or societal engineering. And part of this has to do with uh, inheritance. Women, uh, in the Quran here, the, what they are entitled to with an inheritance. Interesting here. It says here on page 180 in my copy of the Quran here, from what is left by parents and those nearest related, there is a share for men and a share for women. Whether the property be small or large, a determinate share. Now what's interesting here is this. But if at a time of the division other relatives or orphans or poor are present, feed them out of the property and speak to them words of kindness and justice. However, when you get down to the, uh, the fine print here about how the inheritance is split, God directs you, and I'll get the, God directs you, as regards your children's inheritance to the male, a portion equal to that of two females. If only two daughters Two or more, their share is two-thirds of the inheritance. If there's one daughter, the daughter gets half. The male does. Interesting. So if there's one son and one daughter, they split it in half. Of course, if there are more than one daughter, there's two daughters, one son, the son would get more because of the fact it was considered at that time the male had more societal responsibilities. But it just it does show you that in the seventh century, the kind of society Mohammed, in a sense, was looking to build upon. And what's interesting is that some of these theorists are thinking of going back, we're thinking of going back to this. In other words, going with the religion the way it was originally intended. Because if you recall, as I mentioned last week, with the Mamluks, those slave soldiers, Turks moving in from Central Asia. And when they were captured by the Abbots of Caliphate, uh, they were turned into slaves. And they were slave soldiers. But what happens when you get a lot of slave soldiers, especially when you begin promoting them through the ranks as officers? When you had a lot of slave officers, Mamluk officers, what did they do? Well, they hijacked the Abbots of Caliphate. And they began to divorce the idea of the Caliph as not only being the religious leader, but the political leader. And this is what these Islamic theorists, though the Sunni persuasion, these aren't Shias, these are Sunnis, want to gravitate back to. And it's interesting here. The first one on the list is a man, and you probably never heard of this guy before, and that's understandable. Ahmad ibn Tamiya. He's an interesting character. Born in 1263 in Haran in northern Mesopotamia. Uh, Tamiya became renowned for his reactionary viewpoint on Islam, reinforcing his philosophy by becoming a prolific writer, up to 300 volumes. He, he, he actually was actually a big foe of Sufism. In other words, 
this mystic outlook that was what was growing in the Islamic religion, he thought this was clearly wrong, that you need to maintain this conservative outlook of the religion, in other words, a literal interpretation of the religion. If we're going to have this religion and we're going to succeed as a society, we need to have a literal interpretation. And he disagreed with this with the Shia, Shia persuasion and the idea of an imam. Now here, now here he's, here's what one of the one of his the, the building blocks of his of his idea of the religion. He held in contempt the Shia view of imams, enunciating that their outlook was not referenced in the Quran and therefore was unacceptable. He did not believe in a cabal or college of hierarchy of learned as being the only ones able to discern the revered word of God as outlined in the Quran. Imams then were not any better than any other Muslim in reading and understanding Islam, that the Quran should be read and accepted on a, on a literal basis. Again, here is this conservative outlook on this religion. It's very simple. Again, the religion itself is simple. There's no original sin, so there's no baptism. There's no rosary beads, there's no crosses, there's no statues, there's none of this stuff. None of this stuff. Very simple. Give yourself to God, acknowledge God, acknowledge that Muhammad was the one true prophet, the last prophet, Basically, you're in. How simple is this? How simple is this? And they don't want confusion, they don't want disorganization to reign by deviating from this so-called accepted norm. So this idea of the Shias, and again, you can see it on this handout here, outlined where the Shias actually believe that Ali, as the blood relative, being the nephew, slash the son-in-law, but being the nephew here, being the blood relative, begins this line of what they think the succession should be structured on Ali's re family relations. That doesn't exist. That doesn't exist. The caliph should be someone who is wedded to the religion and is concerned with organizing the society. And let's, and let's, and let's bring one thing up, for, up, up front here. That means order. An orderly society based on this religion. Again, this gets back to what I mentioned before about the Quran being actually a manifesto or a blueprint, if you will, of social or societal engineering, arranging society. Fascinating in the seventh century. Absolutely fascinating. However, to me, again, is one of the first to really, or acknowledge, one of the first to be one of these conservative, conservative theorists that's renowned in the 20th century, even the 19th century, even the 18th century, with the next one that's going to come along. In fact, the next man that will come along is actually bouncing off what Tamiya said, and that's Muhammad ibn Abd Wahhab. I know you know that name. That's been in the newspapers. The Wahhabi school. Now that one's important, but that goes back as far as the 18th century. Wahhab was born in 1703. So this, is, this, this, is, goes, this goes back quite a while within part of Saudi Arabia. He is another product of a family of clerics who adhered to the Hanbali school of jurisprudence. That's one of the Islamic schools of jurisprudence. It's a very conservative school. And he would help carry forth the torch of reform of Islam. However, keep in mind, and I mentioned this last week, by the 18th century, the Ottomans had grown noticeably weaker. And one of the reasons for this, that long war against the Safavid Persians for control of Mesopotamia. A war that would last over a hundred years. Remember the hundred years war in Europe? Well, that's not a constant war. It's a series of conflicts historians have seen fit to just conveniently label the hundred years war, although they're all tied to the premise that Britain and France were trying to control Europe. The Hundred Years War. Same thing here. You see the Safavid Persians and the Ottoman Turks dicing for control of this thing called Mesopotamia, later called Iraq. 
Now, the Persians are Persians, they're not Arabs. The Turks are not Arabs, they're Turks. But the Ottomans are Sunnis, the Safavids are, per are Persians, they're Shias. And back, this back and forth that's going on here with Mesopotamia, if you want to call it no man's land, now keep in mind again, it's important to reference that the Persians for the most part are Shias, the Turks for the most part are Sunnis, and Mesopotamia is that dividing line where you see Arabs who are also Shias, Arabs who are also Sunnis. In fact, in modern Iraq today, at least 60% of the Arabs who live there are Shia, and about 20, 23% or so are Sunnis. However, again, I mentioned last week, don't be misled by just religion. It's important to know the difference, but don't be misled by just settling on religion here. And the reason I say that is when Saddam invaded Iran in September of 1980, Shia, Shia Arabs flocked to his banner. Interesting. Why? Going to war with the Persians. Does this smack of what happened four centuries before? Yeah, you could say so. You could say so. But this war went on, on and off for over 100 years. And every time the Ottomans had control of this area, she is living here with second class citizens. Every time the Seven Persians won, won, won around, the Sunnis became second class citizens until 1638 when Murad IV, Ottoman Sultan, wins the day, and the Ottomans are going to hold this place from 1638 to 1918. And the Shias will be second-class citizens here. However, what does that do to a nation or a country or an association if they've been at war for 100 years? Don't they get a little weak? Yeah. So you have the Saud family coming along, and they're going to, and they're going to, uh, they're going to join their their idea of a, of, a, of a mini empire within the Ottoman Empire uh, with the Wahhab school of looking at Islam. Meanwhile, Muhammad ibn Saud originates what's going to be known later as the Saudi state. And he's going to begin to conquer territory in this place that's going to be called Arabia. And he's going to make this, this, this mini empire with the Wahhab school of Islam bringing the religion back to its conservative basis because there are many people in this area who feel that the Ottomans have cheapened the religion. The Sultan really doesn't look after the religious interests. He's just, he's just another monarch. That's not maybe what some of these people want. But at the same time, by the 18th century, having been at war for over 100 years, the Ottomans are weak. The British they're beginning to move into, 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 uh, into Mesopotamia or Middle East in 1763. And the reason for that is they're moving their Indian Empire west. You know, they take a look at this area. They know how to read a map, geography. And they understand that the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, that was perhaps Tsarist Russia could come down those two rivers into the Persian Gulf through the Strait of Hormuz. And where are you? Colonial India. That's the last thing the British want. Because colonial India is the crown jewel of the British Empire. So they begin to move into the Middle East, moving into Basra in 1763, opening up a consulate in 1768, moving up to Baghdad in, seven, in 1798, opening a consulate there in 1802. At the same time that, that the Saud Wahhab school family are trying to establish an empire in Saudi Arabia, in what's going to be Saudi Arabia, you see the Mamluks in, in, uh, in Mesopotamia looking to carve out an empire inside the Ottoman Empire. It's not going to be long before the Ottomans crack down on both of them. But you can see if the Ottomans had been a strong power, this never would have happened, most likely. But it's interesting. The Sauds are nibbling at the cheese. So are the Mamluks. So the British, 1798, the French invade Egypt and the Levant. And, and that's Napoleon. Now, Napoleon doesn't do this at the head of a Napoleonic army. This is, still, this is still revolutionary France. He does this at the head of a French revolutionary army. And they are bringing the ideas of the French Revolution, which is evolving. Liberalism, democracy, republicanism, secularism, socialism, nationalism, parliamentarianism. <laughs> Another country heard from. 
Now, keep in mind, there's various reasons for this. Yes, the French are looking to get into the Middle East, but Napoleon is also looking to draw forces away from Europe with the ongoing war going on in Europe. I read a general who thought one rationale for Putin going into Syria, he was doing the same thing, trying to draw attention away from what was going on in Ukraine. Interesting thought. Mr. Putin being an intelligent man, despite what some people think, uh, perhaps that was a rationale here. Interesting. Interesting. But the French are only going to be there for four years. Treaty of Paris, July, June 25, 182, they're out. But I mean, these ideas are beginning to resonate here. They're beginning to resonate. However, what's interesting here is, and as I note on this sheet, the tribal leader and the fundamentalists set the stage for the religious mission that would come to flavor the political agenda of Saudi Arabia. However, by 1818, Abdallah, who was the last ruler of this so-called empire they're trying to build in, in Arabia, is going to be crushed by the Ottomans. But the ideas are not crushed. The ideas among certain people that we need to go back to a conservative agenda with this religion still resonate. Now, keep in mind, as the, uh, the Ottomans are eventually going to stop the Mamluks, and what they're going to do is they're going to come out with something known as the Tanzimat Laws. They want to try to stop all these competing ideas. In other words, it makes no difference who is who in the Ottoman Empire. We're all Ottomans. Ottomanism. You know, people now are, be uh, people are, now are beginning to question the Ottomans here because they've grown weak. They've grown weak. Egyptians are beginning to feel like Egyptians. Syrians are beginning to feel like Syrians. This idea of Palestinian nationalism is going to develop. Romanians, Serbs, Azerbaijanis, all these people are beginning to feel like supposedly who they are. So is the, is the empire doing this? Yeah, it's going all which ways. So the idea is to bring this to take, bring all these loose ends together. Tanzimat Laws, 1839. A public education system, a secular education system. We're going to raise educational living standards here. This is going to produce people like Mustafa Kamal Ataturk. You can probably say that was a mistake. <laughs> that was a mistake, perhaps. However, there are people coming along here, and I might have mentioned him last week, and I'll mention him again. Rifa El Tatawi, a Muslim cleric from Egypt, born 1801, will die 1873. However, at age 25, in 1826, he goes to France. And what he will witness here is interesting. He will witness the dethroning of Charles X in 1830 who was the last Bourbon in France, the last absolute monarch in France, and the ascension of Louis Philippe of the House of Orléans, a constitutional monarchy. And he's going to bring back what he sees to the Middle East. And he has a, a somewhat enlightened outlook here. An enlightened outlook. Perhaps maybe a more democratic approach to government. Perhaps a better deal for women. Well, there's one for you. Here's one for you. Interesting here. Another one who comes along is an Iranian, Jamal al-Din, who will take as another name al-Afghani. Now, keep in mind, since he's Iranian, he's probably Shia. So if he, takes the name, if he adds al-Afghani to his name, all of a sudden he's a Sunni. He's trying to appeal to a broad range of people. However, let's understand one thing about al-Afghani. Born 1839, dies 1897. He feels that with the growing power of the West, this growing secularism, its superiority in science, economics, keep in mind, the Industrial Revolution is snowballing here. He thinks the people in the Middle East need to get with the program here. They need to modernize themselves, but at the same time, 
do not lose the flavor of their religion, Islam. In other words, the people have to learn is here. Or else they're going to get buried. They're going to get buried. And that's not a bad rationale to make, because what's going to happen to the Ottomans by 1918, and what are the British and the French going to do to this area in 1919, 1920? Create these countries and divide it up, and you know, oil, so on and so forth, and now we're left with the problem we have today. Fascinating progression here. Fascinating progression. Another one was a Muhammad Abdullah. He saw it the same way. In fact, he was kind of an um, admirer of Europe, although understood that, the, again, the people do not wake up if they're not educated, if they don't understand Europe. That's the point here, understanding. Education is something else. Educate the people. Then again, they're going to get buried by, by this tidal wave of European power. In other words, the colonialism of the West. That's what you're seeing here. The colonialism of the West. You know, and, they're going to, and eventually the British and the French are going to divide this area up. However, there's another man that comes along. And he's a Pakistani to be born in 1903. Abel Madudi. Name is funny. However, Madudi does not want to make does not want to make any overtures to the West. His idea is that jihad, going with a holy war, his his idea is even to the point of making jihad a sixth pillar of Islam. Now he's really taking this seriously here. He's a Pakistani. He'll die in 1979, the same year the Russians will march in to begin that long war with the Mujahideen or soldiers of God. And one man will gravitate to his ideas. And his name is on that list. Saeed Qutb. Some have said without Qutb, there's no 9-11. Interesting, there's a quote from from Saeed Qutb, who doesn't start off as a religious fanatic, if that's what you want to call him. And he says here, a Muslim has no nationality except his belief. That's interesting. A Muslim has no nationality except for his belief. Does that sound like something what the Islamic State has gravitated to? Recall, recall that, I might have mentioned that last week, that special that Frontline had about the Islamic State over a year ago. And one of the clips on that program was that bulldozer, an Islamic State bulldozer, plowing the berm down that separated Syria and Iraq from Iraq. Part of the border was a dirt burn. And this bulldozer is plowing it under. And there's a guard standing there, an Islamic State soldier with an AK-47. Young fellow, maybe 22, 24, 25 years old. And he turns to the camera and says, this is the first of many borders to come down. And he was from Argentina. Interesting. Interesting. So when Sayyid Qutb says a Muslim has no nationality except his belief, the Islamic State has picked that up. It's interesting what, it's interesting what they say about him in the, um, their, their, the manifesto for the Islamic State is known as the management of savagery. You can get that online, by the way. And he said, and it's in one of the, it's on page 21. And they talk, and, they, and they're expressing here about Sayyid Qutb. Everything we have recorded here is already reality. This is talking about how the colonial powers are, are trampling the Islamic world. But the most important point is that it is easier for people of knowledge and insight to understand how the process works, how the colonial powers are winning, that is. 
as a result of the bounty of God upon whom boldly plunges into battle. For example, the martyr. And, we, and it says in parentheses, we consider him as such. Saeed Kutub. May God bless him. Interesting. Who dis and, and Kutub discussed the fall of the Soviet Union. Kutub dies in 1966. He's already prophesizing the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, almost 25 years before it happens? Interesting. Now, Kutub is fascinating because he's from Egypt. He sees, obviously here, born in 1906, the British overseeing of Egypt, not very happy at this. Becomes very conservative. Winds up being a teacher. And he will be a prolific writer as well. Will wind up with an with a undying hatred of the United States. Considers us decadent. Immoral. And someone said, well, why don't you go there? So he does. Comes here in 18, 1948, he comes here. And he will go to college here for two years. But when he leaves here, he hates us more than what he got here. And one of his criticisms, just one of them, is the way we manicure our lawns. <laughs> How materialistic can one be? How materialistic can one be? Manicuring our lawns. We've lost all, we have no, we, are a, we have a pow, poverty of spiritualism here. But what really turns him off, at least one of the things that really turns him off while he was here, was the fact he went to a dance. Uh, it, it was given, it was a religious dance. I guess it was a Protestant, one of the Protestant sects. Uh, he went to a dance hall. And... What happens here, the cleric turns the light down, lights down, and these people are dancing. And he, he, he notes that their bodies are touching, and their cheeks are touching, and they're clutching each other in the dark. And he says, the cleric can turn the lights down. He says, how decadent is this? And when he leaves here, he leaves here hating this country worse than when he got here. Keep in mind, by 1950, what has happened here? You know, the British and the French no longer oversee the Western colonial agenda. Who does? The United States. And that goes back to Valentine's Day, 1945, when Franklin D. Roosevelt and Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud made the deal aboard the light cruiser Quincy off Bitter Lakes, Egypt. U.S. military protection for the kingdom versus preferential access to Saudi crude. And every president, be he Democrat and Republican, has catered to that agenda ever since. That's how he sees this. Now, this is a fellow who at first was in the WAFD party. W-A-F-D, if anyone wants the spelling of that, to look it up. It's a very conservative party in Egypt. However, after Nasser, keep in mind, Nasser is a secularist attains power in Egypt in 52, he becomes, he becomes he, he, just before that, he became a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Very conservative in his outlook in the religion. And he will, be, he will be incarcerated from like 52 to 66 when he's executed finally on and off. And he's going to be a prolific writer while he's in jail. And one of his, one of his most noted works is called Milestones. One of his most noted works. He is a, he was, if you want to call it, a committed jihadist. Believed that by this point, there's only one way to throw out the West and to do away with the lackey governments that they support, armed struggle virtually. So he's picking up what Maududi in Pakistan was saying. Interesting. And at the same time, you are seeing these competed notions of secularism in the Middle East. Again, go back to the 1920s. Michael Aflac in Syria. Saleh al batar in Syria. Helped put together the Ba'ath Party. 
And, but, and, and uh, Michael Aflac was, was actually influenced by things such as socialism, uh, Marxism, and to, a, and to a degree fascism, to fashion this Ba'ath Party. Now this Ba'ath Party believes in a pan-Arabic agenda. In other words, we're all Arabs. We're all part of this giant tribe known as Arabs. And the Ba'ath Party is a practitioner of this agenda. Almost like in Nazi Germany, the Ehrenvolk. Does it make any difference where Germans are? No, we're Germans. Isn't that what the Nazi Party was propagating in the 1930s? Yeah, it sure was. It sure was. Fascism. Fascism. Catering to the nationalism to push the agenda. Well, what do you think, what do you think the Baptist Party was intimating here in the 1930s, the 40s, the 50s? Of course, that's going to change later on. You know, it's like anything else. Some things, man, man, man's interesting. Foments an agenda or a movement, and what happens to it later on? Is it altered? Yeah. Especially when you get more people involved in it. More opinions. More axes to grind. What, ha what happened with Mohammed's movement in the beginning? I mentioned this last, last week. You know, by the time he takes Medina, or Mecca, and by the time he begins to or organize most of Arabia into this giant clan known as Islam, I mean, he had, he had converts or Muslims, he had pagans, he had some Christians, and he had some Jewish people here in the Ummah, the community of people, and it worked. In the beginning, it worked. But what happens when you expand something? It becomes a problem, doesn't it? Especially when somebody like Mohammed does not, does not get ready for a successor. Now, people other than himself have to arrange or pick a successor. Is that going to, you know, a lot of these movements, a lot of these movements are based off what? The personality of the founder. You saw this in the Soviet Union. The Bolshevik party what, had Lenin's personality all over it. What happened when Lenin died? You had the standoff or competition between Trotsky and Stalin. Well, Trotsky was the brilliant orator, wasn't he? He was the brilliant political theorist. I know, when I went to Noah Community College, I had a college professor named Eric De Pendleton. And uh, he was probably my favorite teacher. And of course, back then, I was, I was a registered Republican. He was a socialist. And, uh, but he would take me to these, we'd go to these discussions. And, uh, but he told me, when he was 18, he met Trotsky in 1939 in Mexico. And he said, I had the occasion to sit down twice and talk to Trotsky. Me being a young student, him being the hardened political revolutionary. And he said, well, he says, I wouldn't trade that experience. He said, the mind. And he said, to sit down and talk to a fellow like this for an hour and a half, two hours at a clip about politics, world affairs, and, he, and up to when I, he's, he's since passed, uh, up to the time when I was uh, in his classes, uh, he says he never forgot this. Never forgot this. We'll go back to Russia. You know, again, Trotsky, the brilliant political theorist, the, the brilliant orator, Stalin. I don't, know, I don't know how many people have ever heard one of Stalin's speeches. Uh, there's more to Stalin than, 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 than speaking. <laughs> Uh, but Stalin was a great backroom politician. You know, the, he, was, he staffed many of the government portfolios with people who owed allegiance to him. So when it came to the party congress to decide who's going to lead the Soviet Union, well, who do you think is going to win this? Stalin. And then what does Stalin do? He embarks on that course of forced industrialization comes to the same realization that maybe some of these Islamic theorists or some of these secular theorists in, in the Middle East are coming to, we better modernize here or else we're going to get buried. This is what Stalin's going to do, 1928. Program of forced industrialization. You think Stalin trusts Versailles? He's not stupid. He knows another war is coming. But this time, I don't want us caught because he's going to take this country from being a a backward peasant economy to an atomic bomb by 1949. You can say whatever you want about it. 
But in a generation, accomplishing that, of course, someone killed 20 million people, so what? We're talking Joe Stalin here, he doesn't care anyway. But I got what I wanted. Got what I wanted. But it changes the idea of the Bolshevik party. Well, he really wasn't a communist anyway. What he's doing is an example of state capitalism. And he's going to purge the old line Bolsheviks out. In many cases, some are going to be shot. And this paves the way for Nikita Khrushchev and Kosygin and Brezhnev and people like this. Saddam is going to do the same thing later on with the, with the, with the Ba'athist party. Same thing. Because by, by, by at the end of the 60s, pan-Arabism is doing this. Now, the Arabs lost the 56 war, they lost the 67 war, and they're going to lose the 73 war. So this idea of pan-Arabism isn't quite working out. So Saddam is going to take this party and localize it like Stalin did with the Bolshevik party in Russia. He's going to imprint his own authority on it. In other words, his personality. So it's no longer the pan-Arabist movement. Yeah, sure, we're Arabs, but of the Iraqi variety. He's going to localize the party for his own agenda. Same thing Stalin did with the Bolshevik party in Russia. Same thing. Not any different here. But Kutub, his, his, his influence is still with us today. This idea of this armed struggle. And it seems like so far, they've won out with this control of this religion. It seems like they have. Although I'm a firm believer that pan-Arabism or this, or this secular agenda really hasn't died. And the reason I say that is if you look at the Islamic State, and we'll look at this in the last talk, you know, they're not just a bunch of religious fanatics. Saddam, elements of Saddam's Baptist party are involved in this. Some of the Republican Guard are soldiers in this. Which, which, which would lead you to think that if they ever did take Baghdad, is this coalition going to survive? That I leave to you to decide that one. That I leave to you to decide that one. Interesting here. Another one of these theorists. Of course, he's not going to live as long as Kutub. Kutub's going to die in 1966 because he's going to be hung, uh, being caught up in a plot against Nasser. He will be hung. But another one born the same year as Kutub is Hassan al banan born in 1906 in Egypt. He too, although he's not, he's not as, um, well, I would say, wouldn't say, he was radical, but not as radical as perhaps uh, Maududi in Pakistan, and so he could have been later would be. Uh, he, it's interesting. He's, he, you know, he, he, 1906, sees the First World War, and what he also does is, and by age 13, he's taken to the streets against British occupation of Egypt. And by age 14, he's memorizing the Quran. Fascinating character here. By age 14, he's memorizing the Quran. He will later become a he will later become a popular orator. He's anti-colonial, obviously. He wants the British out, wants foreign influence out. He, his brother, and several others will form the Muslim Brotherhood. His writings are popular. His speeches are popular. However, he will be assassinated in 1949 at age 43 in his office in Cairo by a government agent. But his imprint, his imprint is undeniable here. Now, some people have said, some people associated with trying to throw the colonial agenda out, you know, the, the more radical types, do not think the Muslim Brotherhood is radical enough. They don't think they're radical enough. They're too willing to accommodate with the powers that be to push their agenda forward. That's how some people think. However, there's another one here who comes along. And he, and he was in the news not all that long ago. Haj Amin al-Husseini, or the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Uh, not all that long ago, uh, Netanyahu in Israel was saying that um, <coughs> that Hajj Amin al-Hussein, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, 
is the one that pushed the Nazis to exterminate the Jews. Now let's understand one thing. Uh, yes, he was for the extermination of the Jews. But I think it was more than him that pushed the Nazis to do that. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think that's quite the case. At least I haven't seen anything positive to say that. Although he did tell, he, when he escaped the Middle East and got to Nazi Germany, he did, push, he did push the Nazis, when you eventually get to Palestine, round up all the Jews and exterminate them. That's what he pushed. But having been born in this area, actually serves, and he actually, this is interesting here, as I mentioned in this, in this handout, he was educated in Islamic, Ottoman, and Catholic schools. There's an interesting cocktail. And he serves in the Ottoman army in the First World War. Actually born in 1895 or 1897. Uh, there's kind of a conflict when he was born. Uh, becomes very much a Palestinian nationalist wanting the Jewish people thrown out. 1918, 1920, 1921. Supports the uprising in, in, in Syria, 1919, 1920. Mercilessly put down, put down by the French. You know, as this at this at this point, the mandates the French are going to get are going to get Syria and Lebanon, and the British are fashioning Ukraine. And what the, the mandates are interesting here. This is this is just this is just Versailles opening up this area to, call, to be colonized by the British and the French. You know, the British and the French, according to the mandate, will stay here until these people show that they can rule or or, or maintain their own countries. Who the heck decides that? Of course, let's understand one thing here, too. There's now oil in the mix. Oil in the mix. Of course, at the same time, now what's interesting here, whenever you have a breakdown in central authority, I'm talking in this case the Ottomans, you're seeing the British and the French take advantage of this. Abdul Aziz, Abdul Aziz uh, the, the, the Saudi monarch, well, you want to call him a monarch, is now pushing to organize Saudi Arabia, what's going to be called Saudi Arabia. And he's going to establish the Wahhab School of Islam and made it with the Saudi house. And he's going to virtually create a fundamentalist state. I know, I know that it's a popular notion to say that, that the Ayatollah opened up the first real fundamentalist style of government in the Middle East. But one has to really take odds with that, with the Saudi family and the Wahhab school by 1933, called in this place called Saudi Arabia. Of course, keep in mind they're going to they're strike. They're going to have oil here by 1936. So you know what's going to happen here. And this is with the acquiescence of the British. This is with the acquiescence of the British. It's fascinating what's going on here. Fascinating what's going on. But, uh, but, uh, but the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem is very much anti-colonial, anti-Jewish. And he will take part in the 1936-1939 uprising in Palestine. Of course, he's going, to have to, he's going to have to get out of the neighborhood. He goes to Iraq. I believe he goes to Iran, but then he winds up in Germany by 1939-1940. By he will wind up with his own radio broadcast from Nazi Germany, trying to foment discontent in the Middle East, trumpeting the Nazi movement, saying that, the, saying that Germany never wanted to colonize the, the area, the area of the Middle East. The British and the Russians were. The British and Russians wanted to. Interesting what he's saying here. At the same time, he also helps to organize a Bosnian Muslim military formation for the Waffen SS. And when the war is over with, he will not be prosecuted at Nuremberg. <coughs> he will not be prosecuted. He'll go to Egypt and then back to Palestine. And any attempts on his part to really run Palestine for his own purposes will be undermined by Nasser. He's going to die in 1974. Uh, in fact, he was going to. In fact, by, by 1959, the Palestine Liberation Organization comes along, the PLO, and 
who's going to run that but Yasser Arafat. So, you know, somebody like the Grand Mufti is retreating into the background, and it's the younger set coming up to take this idea of the struggle against Israel and the colonial West well, at that point. However, what's interesting here, too, is despite the fact you're seeing some of these so-called religious types, you also had the secularists. Going back to George Habash, 1950, Nafalai, Wadi Haddad, if you remember the Palestine, Liber the pa the General, the General Palestine Liberation Organization, it was also the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. The Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine is interesting. It's secular. It's not religious. You know, you get people like Wadi Haddad, George Habash, people like this. They're not religious, they're secular. And many of them are Christian. Marxists, socialists, looking to throw the Jewish people out of Palestine. Of course, keep in mind, some of these people, some of these people when they were really young, had their land taken away from them from the Jewish people in that struggle in the 1948 war. But they're, but they're, they're eventually going to fade here as you get into the 1960, late 60s, 70s. And again, as I mentioned before, these ideas that the French, French Revolutionary Army brought, secularism, socialism, nationalism, and uh, so on and so forth, these ideas are eventually going to fade. And people are going to gravitate back to the one constant that they have, religion. And when we come back, I come back here next week, I'm going to talk about the Russians in Afghanistan because this is where these jihadis get their guts. 1979 is a huge year for the Sunnis. One of the reasons for that is the Shah will be gone by 79. And the Shias now have a fundamentalist regime in Tehran. The Russians will march into Afghanistan another infidel power looking to exert control over an Islamic country. And Muslims from all over the Islamic world will go here to fight, leading to the Mujahideen, or soldiers of God. So 1979 is a huge year for the Sunnis. Looking at it from their perspective, it's like they're taking it from all sides. The Russians, now the Shias. They do not need, they do not need to be under pressure from another religious sect and then the seculars. It's enough, they got the, the British, well the British are really out of the Middle East by this point because it's 69, uh, Britain informed the United States that they couldn't oversee their commitments anymore and they're gone. So in 71 they're out. And that's when the Shah will be used to oversee Western interests as the policeman. We can't do it because we're stuck in Vietnam. Plus, we have the military commitment in Europe to stand off with the Warsaw Pact. Can't have Israel do it, even though they have the most proficient military in the Middle East. Politically, unpalatable. So, the Shah will be the policeman. But of course, that's not going to last long. The 1978 Iranian Revolution, he will be out by 79, and then Ayatollah Khomeini will take over. But 1979 is a huge year for the Sunnis. A huge year for the Sunnis. So this idea of going back to this conservative agenda, a literal interpretation of the Quran for a basic conservative agenda to try to salvage not only the religion, but the society, you can say he goes back to the 13th century with Ahmed ibn Tamir. He's not the only one, but he's one of these that really stands out for the time. And it's taken all this time to get to this point where you're at, which is the Islamic State at this point. I'm going to talk more about them in the, the, the last talk here. And they're a fascinating character study, if that's what you want to call it. But it's fascinating what's actually happened here. I mean, what you saw with Saudi Arabia as a conservative, fundamentalist state 
coming from the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Fascinating here. And then you see the Islamic State coming as a result of what? The United States pulling out of Iraq? Whenever there's a void, doesn't somebody try to fill it? Yes. What do you think is happening in Ukraine right now? Interesting. Anybody have any questions? Or any comments? Yes? Under Tito, it seems like... Uh, the strong man? Yeah, the Turks were um, secular. And under Saddam, the Iraqis were secular. And, under, and in Egypt, at one point, it was somewhat secular. But that doesn't seem to apply to the Sunnis in Saudi Arabia. As being, not, they're not, they've never been really secular. Well, the, the Wahhabi school, uh, the basis of that doctrine is uh, to spread the religion, the, a conservative brand of, of the religion, uh, through those madrasas, those religious schools. Uh, yeah, they, you know, it's, it's even to the point where at times in Saudi Arabia that um, outlandish laughing was forbidden, uh, movies occasionally forbidden, uh, women, uh, you know, uh, not driving, so on and so forth. Yeah, that's, that's been the case in Saudi Arabia. And, and, and depending on which time, sometimes that, that, that religious backlash to, consider, to, to what's considered secular, uh, secular encroachments, uh, you know, it, it, it ebbs and it flows. For, I'll give you, for instance, when Saddam marched into uh, Kuwait, you mentioned the secular leader, even though he was a Sunni, the secular leader, uh, when he marched into Kuwait, Osama bin Laden was willing to bring the jihadis who had fought in Afghanistan to Saudi Arabia to throw them out. And that's when he's told, no, don't bother. <laughs> uh, the United States and NATO and so on and so forth are coming to Saudi Arabia to eject them. Well, that's the last thing a guy like Osama bin Laden wants to hear because that's where Medina and Mecca are in Saudi Arabia, the two holiest sites. Now we have infidels, we threw infidels out of Afghanistan, now we're going to have them here? I mean, you know, put yourself in his place if you're really wedded to this religion, having young American soldiers, females, in short sleeve shirts running around. That's not going to set well. Uh, so, yeah. So, and then, and then if you go back to, I know this has been floating around, based off what you just asked, this has been floating around lately, the missing 28 pages and that, uh, trying to understand Saudi Arabia's role in 9-11. Uh, um, you think we're going to sue, to bring suits against Saudi Arabia? And then Saudi Arabia has turned around and said that they'll, they might pull some of their assets out. And, uh, they sell $750 billion worth of treasury bills, T-notes, certificates of deposit, so on and so forth. Now, how far this goes, I don't know. A month ago, I heard this morning yeah. that Right, exactly. Exactly. Well, yeah, it is. Uh, will it, how far will it go? That remains to be seen. That remains to be seen. Uh, but these so called madrasas or religious schools, take Pakistan, for instance, uh, where some of these orphans from the, Pakist from the, uh, the Soviet invasion of, of Afghanistan, uh, you know, six year olds, eight year olds, nine year olds, ten year olds, uh, they're in the refugee camps in Pakistan. They wind up, some of these kids wind up in the madrasas, so how do you think they are by the time they're 16, 17? You know, this conservative religious education, and some of them wind up as jihadis. And they're later going to be in fighting maybe in Afghanistan, but also Bosnia, you know, the Yugoslavia, Kosovo. How about Chechnya? And what's interesting here, you want to see the spread of this, uh, it's, it's supposedly understood now that that government in Kiev, that pseudo-fascist government we helped install in Kiev, uh, courtesy of Victoria Nuland, who was appointed by Hillary Clinton in the State Department, and she and Victoria Nuland is married to Bob Kagan, uh, another neocon here. Uh, the fact of the matter is here, now you have uh, some of those military formations that the Kiev government has put into Eastern Ukraine, like the Azov Battalion, some of these guys wearing World War II German helmets with swastikas on them, are now be allied with some of the jihadis from Chechnya. You know, and who do they have ties with? 
Slavic state. And they're fighting against the separatists slash the Russians. Now, perhaps maybe that's why you can put two and two together. Maybe you won't get four, but let's, let's play devil's advocate here. Maybe that's one reason why Mr. Putin pulled some of his troops out of Syria, and maybe he sent them back to Eastern, Eastern Ukraine. It's just a for instance here. Since Mr. Assad seems now like he's, uh, God bless you, seems like now he's on an even keel. And his army, backed by, by Russian air power, is pressing its case against these so-called uh, jihadis, guerrilla, anti-Assad guerrillas, whatever you want to call them at this point. Of course, you know, this, this so-called free Syrian army, uh, you, can make, you can make bets on, on some of this that these guys aren't Democrats. <laughs> All right, let's try to understand this situation here. Yes? Uh, if Islamic State is uh, something of a pan-Arab uh, movement. Or a pan-Islamic pan movement. Pan -Islamic. Right, which is taken over from pan-Arabist agenda, uh, a pan which is interesting. But all those pan-Arab, pan-Islamic, um, they end up, as, as um, communism did, um, in Europe, or Marxism, I should say, um, the Soviets began being internationalists. And Stalin wouldn't let anybody say um, Nazi, which is national socialism. You could call them fascists, but you could call them Nazis. Because he was Soviet socialism. He didn't want anybody to make a confusion and think that the Nazis were socialists. And uh, so which, of course, is the same damn thing. So um, we're just questioning how this is going to break out in. Uh, in due course, that this, these ethnic, tribal, family, uh, nationalistic feelings will reassert themselves in the Islamic State and it'll break off into different. It's asking about the viability of the Islamic State, comparing it to a certain extent to uh, the Nazis and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Soviet, the Communist Party and the Soviet Union. How, what's going to happen to it? Yeah, it'll evolve. It's evolving now. I mean, it, sure, they, sure, they set up shop in Iraq and Syria and tore some of the border down. Islamic State. There are no borders. Remember what that, is, that Islamic State soldier said. This is the first of many borders to come down. Which means they would eventually like to eliminate Saudi Arabia. And some of these guys come out of these madrasa schools. You know, is this a point where sometimes revolutions eat their own children? That old saying. There's some truth to it. Uh, but if, if, you, if you look at a map here, you'll see that the Islamic State has set up shop in Libya, haven't they? How about Yemen? How about Afghanistan? That makes the Taliban real happy. Another competitor. So if they're going to get pushed out of Iraq and Syria eventually, they have other places to go. Isn't that what Al-Qaeda did? Again, I, I know I said this before, I like to call it the Jello effect. What happens when you step on Jello? <laughs> Right? And remember, remember Afghanistan when Al Qaeda was there after 9 11. What did we do? Boy, we bombed the stuffing out of that place. But what did Al Qaeda do after that? Yemen, later Iraq, uh, Somalia. It went all over the place. The Jello effect. Sure, you can, you can stomp it in one place, but what happens? They open up chapters. They, they, they franchise like McDonald's. It's <laughs> basically what they've done here. So the Islamic State, with its rudiments from Al-Qaeda, is probably thinking along the same lines. If we get thrown out of Iraq and Syria, well, we, got to, we can go to Libya, we can go to Afghanistan, we can go to Somalia, whatever the case may be. Yemen, whatever the case may be. Or the cloud. Big your pardon? They can exist in the cloud. They can, she says they can exist in the cloud. That's what they're trying. <laughs> but, I mean, the fact of the matter is, are they in this for the long haul? Yes. But the question is, is the American public in this for the long haul? That could be a determining factor here. We have other things to do than grab an AK-47 and go into the mountains. They don't. Especially when they look back at history and they see this has been, this has been an area for constant occupation for centuries. You know, and you're and you're seeing a backlash to this. That's why. That's why when you know you you, you hear certain presidential candidates say, "I'm going to carpet bomb them." Well, what was that going to do? 
You think that's going to solve your problem? Again, I always, whenever I hear that, I always go back to the British in 1919. Sir Hugh Boom Trenchard. You know, this thing called air power was new. Was new. You know, people are enamored with new technology here. They always are. And, but when 19, 18, 19, 19 comes along, this thing, air power, is maturing and quickly. It's maturing quickly. And here you have the Royal Air Force, the superlative Royal Air Force. You know what's interesting? It used to be known as the Royal Flying Corps. And they changed the, they changed the name to Royal Air Force on April 1, 1918, April Fool's Day. <laughs> but here, by Armistice Day, 1918, the superlative Air Force, superlative for its time, uh, what do you think happens when a war is over with? Don't the bean cutters start cutting weapons? Aren't trained personnel mustered out? Well, that's the last thing Sir Hugh Boone Trenchard wants. Sir Hugh Boone Trenchard, by the way, was a proponent of strategic bombing. And historically, he is held in high regard by the United States Air Force as a godfather of strategic bombing. Like Julio Douay, later on like our own Billy Mitchell. And what he does is he convinces the British government, this is interesting, he convinces the British government, you know, I mean, in 1919, uh, the war was rough on the British taxpayer. You know, this war wasn't supposed to be as big as it got to be. It was a drain on the British Treasury and the French. But they still want to maintain their colonial empires to help rebuild the mother country, right? Well, that means we've got to station a lot of troops in these colonies. Somaliland, uh, newly minted Iraq, at perhaps Afghanistan, but the, but the Northwest Frontier Province Territories, Colonial India. We need to station troops in these areas. However, Sir Hugh Boom Trencher comes along and says, you know, you don't need to put as many troops in these areas. Use air power to keep these rebel concentric villagers in line. And that's exactly what they're going to do. People in a village in the outback get out of line, send a few bombers over and squash them. Works. Well, these people haven't been bombed before. They haven't been bombed before. You think they have, you think they have sophisticated anti-aircraft weapons? They don't even have weapons, some of these people. That's going to change over time. But that's what you're seeing now, perhaps, with the drone program. The Air Force calls this air policing. I like to gravitate to the term the constabulary use of air power. To me, that kind of tells you what it means, what it is. And this works in the beginning because people hadn't been bombed before. However, are you going to raise the ire of these villagers? Well, you know you will. But then you have to ask the question, did it work for a short period of time? Yes. But now I ask the long-term political question. The British still in Iraq? Or the British still in Somalia? Are the British still in Afghanistan? Or the British still in India? No. So did it work for the long term? No. However, what's interesting here is just to take it a step further, what you saw, the British and the French were doing this too, and they're in their, in their colonial held debtors. They were using planes to bomb villagers uh, so they wouldn't have to use as many troops. What happens is later on, we, the Marine Corps did this in Nicaragua, late 20s, early 30s. They took the British chapter and adopted it here in Nicaragua. So this idea of using ground support and a tactical agenda to support ground troops against guerrillas is beginning to gain momentum here. Vietnam come to mind here? Uh -huh. So later on, you're going to see this idea of using air power to bomb villagers now it's going to happen in the 1930s. Doesn't Italy use uh, uh, air, its, its air force to bomb the Abyssinians? Right. Yeah, Ethiopia, right. To the point of using poison gas. 1936, Spanish Civil War. Aren't German and Italian bombers going to support Franco? Remember the city of Guernica? How about the Japanese invasion of China? Shanghai, Shanghai Hankou, Chungking. Airplanes are going to bomb the cities. And then what happens in World War II? Strategic bombing. 
And the same people, now what, what's interesting here is, is Sir Arthur Harris, who will later become commander of Bomber Command, World War II. Bomber Harris. Bomber Harris, right. And he was a pilot in trying to, he was a pilot with the RAF, trying to keep these villagers in line. Now he's in command of this superlative Bomber Command of the Royal Air Force. And he's going to use British bombers at night in night area bombing and bomb German cities. The idea here is to send a few pathfinders, what they call pathfinders over. They drop some incendiaries, they light the fires, and now you got 500, 700, 1,000 bombers come in behind the pathfinders and just drop their loads on the city. And it's indiscriminate and it's horrifying because now we're not only, we're not just sending a few bombers over a village anymore, we have now taken this idea of the constabulary use of air power and turned it into a strategic agenda. Bombing an enemy's capability to wage war. That's exactly what we did. Interesting how, this, how, how these military concepts evolve here. <coughs> fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Yes? Can I just, just as an introduction for next week, um, is one of, the, one of the reasons that Russia did invade Afghanistan at that time, 79, was what I understood at the time, um, was because they felt they needed a couple things, a buffer against Iran's rising radicalism. They needed Afghanistan, and also to their own, the Soviet Union had all those Muslim, you know, the population of their Muslim population is going to be bigger than about 20 percent at that point. of the population. So they we're trying to establish some, you know, an edge to their problems. Is that, or were there many other? No, that's part of it. But also part of the agenda here is keep in mind one thing: when the United, when they see the United States losing in Vietnam, you know, mm -hmm. sure, you had that Cold War standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union. And part of that was you know, uh, trying to make sure that the, that the outlying districts, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, so on and so forth, the uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union were the two new power brokers in the world. And they're looking at their turfs. However, you know, once, you, once, you, once you have the map set up, sometimes, it 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 it, 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 makes, it makes power it makes power brokers in Washington and, and, and Moscow a little antsy here. The Shah's gone. Oh my gosh! Uh, the United States lost in Vietnam. Now what is this going to do to this carefully crafted balance of power? Now does that mean we have to put troops in Afghanistan to make sure this so-called socialist government takes root? So they're going to put troops in Afghanistan. In fact, what was it? Um, I think it might have been Trotsky. Trotsky back in the early 20s once said that the way to Western Europe was through Afghanistan. Yeah. And then sweep everything west. Um, so th this idea of having uh, these great powers exercising, exercising, their, exercising their power like impudent beach boys on a Sunday afternoon at calf pasture, perhaps, uh, resonates here. It doesn't stop. Interesting how this is. So pretty geographical. A part of it's geographical, yeah. Yeah. But the Russians are going to, and I'm going to, we'll go into this more next week, they're going to get stuck in what's going to be called their Vietnam. Uh, yes and no. Because isn't that what Brzezinski told Carter? We want to get them stuck in a Vietnam now. And yeah, that's, that's a pretty good rationale. But there are, and I'm going to go into this next week, the differences for the Russians in Afghanistan versus America in Vietnam. And there are distinct differences here. The rationale is a pretty good one. They got stuck. They're mired in a quagmire. But they're not, but you know, Viet, the Afghanistan, uh, again, uh, uh, compared to... Uh, Compared to Vietnam, it's not a cookie cutter approach here. That, 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 that doesn't resonate at all. So there are differences. But they got stuck like we got stuck. That's the bottom line there. But no, there, there's, so, so even though, as I mentioned before, 1979 is an important year for, for Sunnis, that was an important year for the Russians. Because now the, the, the balance of power, the scheme might be changing here, and they're reacting to how they think they should react to that, to that scheme, the change in that scheme. 
You know, the very, you know, reactionary powers do not like change. They don't like change. Which, you know, where I work at Army Aviation Magazine, I've always brought up, uh, you know, how the atomic bomb changed warfare, even to the point of using a helicopter. And, you know, you had, you had two generals like uh, Roy Geiger of the United States Marine Corps and James Gavin of the United States Army were pushing the idea of using a helicopter to move people around because the atomic bomb, you, you, if you have too many people clustered in one area, now you drop an atomic bomb, what happened to all those troops? But you can use the helicopter to disperse people and then bring them back together again. Now these are two guys, you've heard that saying before, oh gee whiz, they're fighting this war like the last war. Well now you've got two guys thinking out of the box. We can't fight the next war like we fought the last war. In fact, it was General Geiger who says, the day of the old amphibious style landings of guys just running out of the landing barges with the atomic bomb, that's over. And that's how we have to think. He says this in 1946, three years before the Russians get the bomb. In fact, he told, when he wrote his letter to Archie Vandergriff, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, he told him in 1946 that the United States would not hold a monopoly. So we better plan now. And Vandergriff agreed. So the Marine Corps, out the door. Out, out the starting gate. Interesting. Interesting how that is. How some people are thinking ahead. Not behind. Interesting. Anybody else? Have, yes, ma'am. Uh, no. Yes, Steve. Yeah, just a, a sidebar on those 28 pages. Supposedly, in those pages, uh, Congress is thinking of the potential families who are victims of terrorist act to sue foreign governments that have been accused. Of course, the, side, the, the reversal of that is we could get sued for drone strikes. That, that, that should happen, you know, so, uh, yeah. You know, so it's like, uh, maybe somebody's not talking, you know. Yeah, it could be messy. Could be messy. But, but that's, that's what happens when you engage in foreign policy. Yeah. Nothing goes up in a straight line. You know, there, there, there is sometimes blowback, as some people call it, or, uh, you know, uh, yeah, happens. 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 Yes, ma'am. Uh, get down to the basics. Can you please give us a brief history of the Quran and where that was formulated and who authored it? Well, the Quran are actually is in a nutshell is just the revelations that Muhammad got from God. He's considered the last true prophet. They will acknowledge uh, people like Abraham, Jesus, so on and so forth. They do. However, they they don't think that they don't believe that Jesus is God's son. They believe he's an important prophet, though. Mm -hmm. But the Quran itself was was written by. Was written after that. Written written after, written after the. Muhammad. No, it was written by people following Muhammad who took all these revelations and put them in a book. In fact, if you want to read it. <laughs> but as I mentioned, going uh, mentioned before, it's actually a, a, a book in social or societal engineering too. Uh, it's interesting uh, how, how how this was arranged back in the seventh century. Although uh, it was inspired by Muhammad. Yeah, it was inspired by. In other words, the, the revelations he supposedly got from God were collated and put into this book. That was done during his lifetime, though. It was started during his lifetime. But keep in mind, too, he's going to be dead by 632. Right. And this is going to begin that, uh, that, that problem that's going to follow later on when you get the Sunnis and Shias. Now, both Sunnis and Shias hold to this. There's no dispute there. So in, in essence, the dispute for the, to a certain extent is more political than religious. That's wrong. Now, like, I mean, the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, we all feel God is love. I mean, is there any, and it's all, <clears throat> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of bloody scenes in the Bible, too, all the New Testament. Right. But now, in the Quran, is there any uh, a sense, I should read it, look it over, is there any sense of, Positive thinking and and God loves us. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. 
Oh yeah, God, God as, long, as long as we adhere to God, acknowledge God as God. However, by doing that, uh, Jesus is not God's son. There is no such thing as God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, so on. There's none of that. There's no, there's no original sin. The, 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 the Muslim belief in original sin is, how can you have original sin if you weren't born yet? It's very simple how, how, how this, 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 this philosophy, this ideology is very simple. Of course, understand one thing. It comes out of an area that's tribal and clanish. Yeah. So whenever people say, well, this religion was founded on war, uh, you ha of course, you had differences between tribes and clans, and this is what Muhammad is trying to ameliorate here. However, look at uh, the Jewish people, 13 tribes of Israel. You, don't, you think they got along all the time? No, they didn't. Take a look at uh, Libya. You know, now that Gaddafi, someone jumped back there and mentioned Tito, the strong man. Well, what happened when Tito died? What happened to Yugoslavia? Fell apart. What happened when Gaddafi's gone now in Libya? 158 tribes. You honestly think they're all going to get along? That's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Uh, and I'll get into this more next week. Afghanistan. Huh. Uh, where do you see the map I bring next week? Showing all the all the different ethnicities and truck. It's like going to a restaurant and looking at a menu that's like five pages long. I just want to make the equivalent. Now what do I eat? Yes. Oh, two things. I was looking at Robert, uh, Robert Bobby's book, Closing the Mail Online. And he mentioned something interesting that I I've never noticed. Now, I think one of the things the 12th century he said is that one of the philosophers, very young, and I missed last week, so I just made you use my mind. That um, he basically changed the idea of, of the Christian theory of being so much more inspired by Judaism and Christianity, right. so much is, you know, plagiarized from it, that it was taken to the disciplinary philosophy with the concept of the Christian ideal of right and wrong is something outside of us, which we term their Allah and more moral relativist. And it made me more that, that's, I forget the term, but you know, that's really the closing of the Muslim intellect went to the right. perspective. I mean, the closing of the intellect was. It, she, she's asking about the Quran itself. Just uh, she, mentioning that uh, you, you were you were reading about the Quran, reading about the Quran. It's it's actually mostly social engineering as opposed to being spiritual. Well, there is there is some truth to that. And again, I again I mentioned if if you go back to Hammurabi's law code, what was that? An exercise of social engineering, 1750 BC. Now, wasn't that an exercise in organizing society? Now, I've read one historian, and he might have a point. I can't remember his name, saying that Hammurabi's Law Code in 1750 BC paved the way for this. You know, when, when, you, when, you, when you go through the centuries, Paved the way for this. Now keep in mind too, it's not you're not talking the modern era. Things proceeded slowly. You know, changes were slow. Changes still are slow. But perhaps this organization of society by Hammurabi, even down to the point of trying to tell you how to how to cook your meals, how how marriage is to be consummated. Yeah, exactly. Well, is this another attempt at that? Could be, could be, that historian might be right. That historian might be right. But yeah, at the same time, yeah, it, it is, and I'm convinced that it is, an agenda for social or societal engineering. Even down to, as I mentioned before, uh, inheritance for women versus men. I mean, they even have a chat, I, I staked it out. How, how, to, how to divide the booty as they were moving their empire? How to divide that? 
Now, is that trying to maintain some kind of order? Yes. How about we, that goes back to Muhammad, we'll share things. Instead of having it be a free-for-all. We'll share, we'll share, we'll share, the, we'll share the spoils. You know, we share society, we share the scant resources in the desert. That's part of what comes out of this. Interesting how that is. And when, and when you get tribes like the Bedouin, who were in it in the beginning, let's understand this, for the Bodhi, they were raiders. They're nomadic tribal raiders. These people aren't farmers, folks. Not back then. You know, do unto others as they do unto you is the motto here. Steal, steal from your neighbor. You know, there isn't much in the way of resources in the desert, which is why if you took control of a water hole, you don't think you're not going to fight and scrape to keep it? Fresh water in the desert? Yeah, you're going to try to keep control of it. And another group of people, and I've mentioned this before, the Mongols, same thing in Central Asia. The scant resources of the steppe puts all these tribes, the Mongols, the Tatars, the Uyghurs, the Merkates, the Karaites, the Turkmen, they're all in competition with each other. Of course, in, a, in, in, a, in competition such as that, Sometimes everything is on the line, and if you win, you take, your, you take the losing clan or the losing tribe to the sword. You know, that happened in the desert in Arabia, too. I mean, go back, to what I mentioned, go back to what I mentioned last week. One of the Jewish tribes who opposed Mohammed in 627 after the Battle of the Trench, what does he do? 700 men and... You might as well call them teenage boys. He put to the sword. And the women and children sent him off into slavery. This, again, what the religion founded on war? Okay, but understand the area that you're in. And I think sometimes we don't do that. I, I, I have this, I'm convinced that we do not, when we criticize today, we criticize Harry Truman for dropping the atomic bombs. You can't criticize Harry Truman for that unless you go back to 1945 and understand the situation. You can't judge that by 2016 standards. You can't do that. And you can't do that. Yet, I'll tell you, you talk to the surviving World War II vets and who were slated to go from Europe, especially those guys who had beat the Nazis and now have to be sent to the Philippines or the Marianas for the jump-off point to invade the Japanese home islands. Man, am I glad Harry dropped the bombs. Talk to him. They'll tell you that. You know, nice to say, well, I think that's disgusting. Yet, if you're shouldering an M1 and you're going to get ready to, dr the, to land on Japan, give me the bomb. You'd be the first in line. You'd be the first in line. Interesting how that is. Interesting. Interesting. And the girls that were so long when we come back. Beg your pardon? Girls that were home want them to come back alive. That's it. That's it. That's it. Just not happy to have it done, but. Have yourselves a good evening. Thank you.